Oh, hey, everybody. This is uh, another one of the multifamily uh, offer writing workshops. This is where you come to learn the nitty-gritty of how to uh, draft an offer. Um, we're going, the last couple of months, we've kind of gone a little bit off the reservation. This, the, the format that we've done was a little, little bit different from original, the original format, but we're going to change that today. Today, we're going to go back to the original format and uh, I'm going to take you through a whole entire process. Uh, I happened to receive this particular property in from a student uh, who could not be on the call, and he said, hey, I'd really like to see how you would analyze this deal and see how it compares to what I come up with. So over the next hour, I am going to take this particular property that I have not looked at whatsoever uh, and take you right to the uh, offering of a... Um, of a deal, so offer, making an offer on a deal. So when I say that I haven't looked at this particular property, what I mean is that this is, you know, what you see here is what he sent me over. I've, I've put it all into one file. Uh, so these PDFs are what he sent me. He also sent me over the 2014 financials. Um, but over here we've got the letter of intent, the master lease option contract letter of intent, the long form letter of intent, and the updated LOI. Uh, for an assumption deal and I've added these into the mix because I don't know which offer format is the right one to use so you will see how I figure that out as we go through the entire process now uh, what we're going to do is get a feel for this particular property He gave us a profit and losses he gave us the tax bills and the rent rolls and the water pass through uh, but what I really want to do initially is just to get a handle on what does this deal entail. I want to see what this property is all about, and I'm sure you do too. So let's take a look. Ooh, whoa, now I know why they call it the Tropicana. This is like right out of, of um, the Bahamas, for crying out loud. Okay, uh, so this is uh, Sanford, Florida, Marcus and Millichap offering. Obviously, they're looking for retail. Um, I don't know anything about Sanford, Florida. Uh, if there's anybody on the call that does uh, and they want to add to the conversation, please uh, use the question box, type it in, and uh, and we'll see what you what you know. And you know, this has happened in the past where we've actually analyzed deals right in uh, people's backyards, and they could tell you exactly what the neighborhood is like. So the first thing I look at here is, you know, you're trying to lead with your best foot forward. What is it about this this property that would make me want to uh, uh, you know sign on? I mean, for crying out loud, they they should have mowed the lawn at least. I mean, I'm sure Sanford has lawn mowers and landscapers. They could have cut the lawn here. Probably would have made it look a little bit nicer. No signage whatsoever. Is this the office or are these just other apartments? They're probably the uh, you know the, the two story townhouse units. Um, and I, I say that like I know if there are two-story townhouse units, I don't know. Uh, but that's what it looks like to me. Uh, okay, so let's go back here. There is the uh, broker confidentiality agreement. That's their get out of free jail card. If the stuff that you're, they're sending you turns out to be fraudulent or, or you know, bad news, then yeah, th this is it. Uh, price, okay, check this out. Price is to be determined by market. What does that mean? That means these guys don't even know what the price is at. So they're going to let you come up with it. So no matter what number we come up with, it's going to be the right number. So don't say, like, like other new investors uh, make that big, big mistake, like, oh, my offer price that I worked up on my cash flow analyzer is so much lower than the asking price, I don't even want to submit an offer. Well, we're not going to have that problem here today, are we? No, we are not. I'm going to take a sip of my water. So we're in the Orlando MSA, the Metropolitan Statistical Area. It's good to know. All right, parking lot looks like it could be, uh, you know, updated, striped. Looks a little tired. Looks like one particular tenant. Um, this might even be the office. They do their own landscape and they put in flowers and what have you. Uh, all right, good for them. Uh, now here we have. They're going to show us the property description, the financial analysis, the rent comps, and the sales comps, and the demographics. Typical standard um, um, Marcus and Millichap work. There we go again. Mow the lawn. Look at you got weeds coming up out of the bushes. Send somebody around to clean up the place. This is a solid C property, and it's nothing better than a C. Just by the first three pictures I have looked at, that's what I that's what I've determined. Different different colored doors. 
what else do we see here? Very old, probably 1970s pane, you know, single pane windows. All right, property description. Let's see what they have to say. It's a 120 unit apartment complex built between 73 and 75. Yep, there you have it. Uh, sub market of Orlando. Um, let me see. 12 residential buildings, one leasing office of concrete block construction, which which with pitched shingled roofs. So we're looking at pitched roofs. The property rests in a combined eight and eight and three quarter acres. Let me see. The split is 41s and 56 twos and four two bedroom one bath townhouses. What do you know? I was right on the money. Must be my first day on the job. Uh, with an approximate size of a thousand square feet. Okay, so you know we're looking at pretty good size units. Pretty good size. All of the units are tiled, and the majority of the two or three bedroom units have washer dryer connections. All right, so if they have washer dryer connections, we know we're not going to see any income uh, from uh, or much income from the um, uh, from the uh, laundry contract uh, because there shouldn't be much of a laundry contract. Standalone leasing office, laundry facility, and a swimming pool, which is currently down. Oh, Florida, and the swimming pool doesn't work. Yeah, that a lot of people are going to want to live in that place. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the property is currently experiencing excellent occupancy levels at ninety-five percent, and typically say close to full occupancy. The current rents at their subject are approximately a hundred and thirty dollars less per month than some of the nearby competing rental comp communities. Well, no wonder we have 95% occupancy. They're $130 less. Now keep that number in mind because what we're going to do is take an average rental number for this property, use that as the denominator, and the 130 is going to be the numerator. We're going to find out the percentage that we are below the market. And it's going to be ugly, folks. I guarantee it because these are not high income producing units. So $130 plus uh, per month is an awful lot of money. That's a big percentage of what the total rental income is going to be on these units. So in other words, you got a property that is so far behind the market when it comes to the um, the upside that your your entire existence in owning this property is going to be left in just trying to bring this thing up to market. Okay, Re residents reimburse the owner for water usage and are responsible for all utilities. Okay, that's pretty cool. Um, in 2013, five of the roofs on the B side were replaced as well, five out of the 12. Property is frontage. Okay, subject property situated. Okay, I'm not going to go into that. Okay, 120 units. Majority of units are two and threes. Stabilized occupancy level at 95, rents are 130, all the units of town, walking, okay, tell me nothing new, residency, okay, perfect, all right, Sanford location, I don't care, 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 the offering, let's see here, Seminole County, one and two stories, built in 73 and 75, fee simple ownership, very important that I know that because we were in Texas and they weren't giving me fee simple, I know that they're there's something they need to tell me. And that something happens to be the fact that uh, they probably sold off the mineral rights, so they can't give me fee simple uh, interest. Resident pays, resident pays, resident pays, owner pays for the laundry room gas. Cool. All right, concrete, concrete. Okay, central heat and air. The HVAC is central heat and air. Hmm, that's interesting. It might be a chiller boiler. I don't like that. Pretty pictures. Pride of ownership. How many people on the call today would be looking at this thinking, oh, what I would do to be own a pink and red building? Okay, not not interested, not interested, not important. Mm, that's kind of, you know what I do here is we go and Google, Google Earth and you fly down into this. Like what's this land over here? Uh, this This particular, you know, Part that's all empty. Can they build another apartment complex over there? The fact that this thing is separated by a major thoroughfare, is that going to be a problem for the lenders because they're not non-contiguous properties? Um, yeah, so that, that's, uh, that's pretty good. Look at all the new roofs versus the old roofs. One, two, three, four. I can't tell back there, but it uh, looks like they put on some new roofs. Uh, looks good, looks good. All right, there it is again. Trying to tell you how far they are from the airport. There it is again. Wait a minute, what 
What's the heck? Where's the other section here? That's 25th. Hold on here, folks. So there's one section. There's another one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah. All right, so this is part of the property. I just don't know where the other section is. It must be right. We must be flying over it right now. That's it. Okay, there it is. Okay. Okay, there we go. Current property financials. Now, this is where it gets good. Let's see if we can zoom in on this a little bit more. My tired eyes are not looking at this very well. There's the, the, the split. There's a unit mix. The amount per square footage of each one of these. Total square fo footage. Now, market rent per unit per month. 600, 700, 750, 850. Average rent per month. Average rent, uh, so $472. So if we take the 472 divided by the 600, we're looking at 22% at, uh, 20, below market. The rents are 22% below market. That kind of tells you something when it comes to the, the loss to lease. This property has just been incredibly poorly managed. And the only reason why they have 97% occupancy isn't because it's a beautiful place to live. It's because it's 22% it's below the market. Now, if your value play is to come in there and turn this thing around and increase the rents, don't think you're going to do that overnight. The only way you're going to do that is by totally kicking everybody out that likes to pay 22% below the market and putting new people in who, who will pay market rents. But the people who will pay market rents are those people who, are, uh, who want the new amenities, who want the clean units, who want the new carpets. So you're going to have to pay a lot of money to turn these units. Now, one of the other things that really is interesting in, in my thought process here is if these properties were 22% below the market, why isn't, the, why isn't the guy renting to Section 8? If he rents to Section 8, if this property can qualify for Section 8, he'd be getting the, the market rents. So why is he 22% below the market? The reason being, hands anyone? Show of hands, Bob Marin. Bob, you know the answer to this one. The answer is because this property is not approved by Section 8. It is so far below the Section 8 standards that Section 8 will not allow any of their vouchers into that property. Now, how do I know this? I purely conjecture. But there's some reason why this property is so far below market and Section 8 isn't taking advantage of it. And that's the, what I, the reason I just gave you is typically the reason why. So that's a problem for you. The problem is, you know, you don't want to go in there and already have a black eye with Section 8. You want Section 8 to know, like, hey, new, new kid in town, new owner, I'm ready to start working with you guys. Forget about the problems you had with the, with the last guy. I'm here to, to make your life a lot better. So that's, that's um, what you want to um, think about when you see a property that is this far below, a C-class property that is this far below the market. That's a problem. All right? So let's go back down. Let me just check it for any questions. Anybody have any questions? No. Because I explain things so incredibly well. All right. Uh, okay, so take a look. <laughs> oh, I should, uh, I should start calling on people. Start putting you on, on the spot. Where is the, where's the thing? Who can I call on? Who can I call on that would know the answer to this? Hmm. Oh, I could call on my friend from Michigan. Call on my friend from Michigan. What's the trick here that uh, brokers are using with the income and expense statement? What is it? Can anybody see it? If you, if you see it, type it right into the, uh, into the question block. What is wrong? Well, not that it's pro forma. There's something a little bit more specific here. Um, there's something a little bit more specific here that I, I can't stand whenever I see a... Um, a uh, one of these types of things. Oh, bam! My friend from Michigan nailed it. Yep, and so did so did Lynn. Exactly. See that number right there? T three, T three actuals. Let me explain what this means. What they're saying is on the actual numbers, not the pro forma, the actuals. They are only showing you the trailing three months. So on December 2014, 
They're taking October, November, and December income and expenses, multiplying them by four, and coming up with annualized numbers. That doesn't work for me. If this property is 97% occupied, why don't you show me 97% for the last 12 months? I'd like to see how well you did in collecting for the last 12 months. This is the oldest trick in the book that brokers play because this property has not performed well over the last 12 months. And they don't want to let you see what happened over the last 12 months. So right away, you think to yourself, oh man, you know, these numbers look great. Now if I take these numbers and stick them into my cash flow analyzer, this is a great property. But you're not going to buy based upon a T3. You're buying based upon a T12. Now in, remember back here, in this section, we have the where is it, 2014 financials in Excel. So I, I haven't looked at these yet. I'm hoping that it's 12 months worth of numbers. And if it's 12 months worth of numbers, remember this number right here, $800,000, 795, 795,884. That's the gross potential. Actually, let me knock it down a little bit. Let's come down. Total effective rental income, uh, effective gross income. Uh, right here, $830,000. So remember that number, $830,000, when we look at the at the, uh, the actual financials for 2014. We want to see what the actuals look like when compared to this gentleman's uh, or woman's uh, trailing three-month numbers, okay? Uh, also adjusted, yeah, let me see, where's that? Yeah, adjusted. Adjusted for what? You know, what does the adjustment mean? What That, that, uh, that could throw you for a loop. I mean, if you don't know, if you don't look at these reports with a jaundiced eye, you might fall for this trick. Don't fall for this trick, folks. This is what other students do. All right, so we come down here. Uh, they come into expenses. Now this part gets into the expenses. As you can see, I'm kind of going quickly through this because I really want to get my hands on that on that trailing 12, uh, 2014. That's really what I'm going to use to, to come up with my uh, analysis. Um, Okay, let me just check what he has for income. Uh, income, gross potential, loss to lease, physical vacancy, economic non-revenue units, uh, down units, bad debt, uh, total economic. Okay, so laundry and vending, water reimbursement. There's a good, um, there's a good number right there. The water reimbursement. So he is collecting uh, that water amount, uh, and it represents nine percent of the total income of the property just for the water. Wow, that's pretty high. Uh, okay, so we get more into then we come down to the NOI, $382,000 NOI. Remember that number, $382,000. Uh, we're going to see how well that did against the, the uh, 2014 actuals. Uh, okay, this is where we're going to find out the answers to those questions, like what does adjusted mean? Um, okay, I'm not going to go through this, but this is where the broker covers his tail uh, by telling you what all of the, all the numbers represent. Um, very important. You can usually get some good information off of this, these notes and assumptions. It kind of lets you understand what's in the mind of the broker, what he feels needs to be done in order to either make this a better property or make the property look better. Okay? I mean, I, that may sound like the, the one and the same thing. It, it, it isn't. Uh, so just keep this in mind that you've got to really look at these notes and assumptions as you go through it. Uh, here's a cash flow analysis. Too small. Not going to analyze that with you here right now. We're going to use that Excel document. Growth rates, who cares? This is all conjecture. Um, all right. Now, the thing is that uh, had you listened to the uh, group coaching call the other night when we spoke to the investor from Kansas City, Paul uh, Worcester, Paul has a phenomenal way of, of looking at deals from more of a dynamic approach. Now, what I learned as to how Paul would analyze a deal like this is Paul would know the Sanford marketplace. He would know exactly what's going on in this particular area, the submarket of this marketplace. And he would look at this and say, yeah, you know what? These rents really are that far below. And I have a great rep, rep, uh, relationship with Section 8. I know they will allow me to put Section 8 people in here. And if they put Section 8 people in there, I know I'm going to get $130 per unit per year uh, on the rent. So Paul knows that this particular property could be an absolute diamond in the rough. But is he going to offer his price based upon that? Absolutely not. He's going to use it at the, at the uh, rental income that's 22% below market. And that's where he's going to make his, you know, essentially get his profit on this deal. 
So he understands what, what's going on in this marketplace, and he knows that this could be a potential steal, but he's not going to let he's not going to let the price get too high and too much out of hand because he's going to make his profit. Okay, more pretty pictures uh, gives you an idea of where the property is in relation to the marketplace. Folks, don't fall for the broker's rent comps. Don't fall, fall for the broker's sales comps. Do your own. Make sure you know what other units are available in that particular marketplace. Um, you know, look at this. Here's Tropicana. The first rental comp is way down here. Second is over here. The fifth is way up here. Are these really the best rental comps they could come up with? No, I'd say you know they need to find things that are closer. So just keep that in mind when you're looking at it. The, the broker is going to make, make the property look as good as it possibly can, and so therefore he's going to choose the right rents and the right sales comps that uh, match his story. So make sure you do your own analysis. That's, that's in here. Same with the sales comps. Same, same exact thing with the sales comps. Okay, really, that's it. That's all I got out of this one. I don't really care. I got a good feel for the property. It's a solid C-class property. You know, it's got some uh, warts on it. It's not the prettiest thing in town unless you like pink and red. Um, it, they obviously, it is just a C-class property. Um, you know, it is what it is. This thing, the only way this property, I would be interested in this property is if the numbers smoked. And if someone who has boots on the ground that understand exactly how these property, how this market works could tell me that, hey, you know what, this, uh, this particular property really, we can get $130,000 higher than, than before. Okay, here's the page that I'm looking for. This is it, one page, January all the way through to December. All right, what did we say that the, um, <laughs> what did we say the NOI was from the broker? Uh, let's see here. Anybody, anybody have it off the top of their head? Uh, 382. Thanks, but thanks, Bob. Yeah, Bob. What a good little student he turned out to be. He was a little disruptive in class early on, but um, we're getting to like him. 382. Look at what the NOI is out of actuals. 232. 382. 232. Folks, remember the formula is for figuring out what the value of property is. If we take 382 minus 232 equals 150,000 dollars at, you know, let's say it's a, it's an 8 cap, you're looking at about $1.8 million difference in valuation at an 8 cap. From what the broker told you on his sales package to what the actual income and expenses were for the year. A difference in price of $1.8 million. That's huge. So don't believe what the, what the brokers show you on those trailing threes. Now do you understand why he only showed you three months of 97% occupancy? Well, if it's 97% occupancy for the last 12 months, why can't you just uh, you know, you know, tell me what, um, what the actual numbers are? Let's see. The thing, that, the thing that's strange about that, though, folks, take a look at this. And I'm not going to dig down too deep into it, but, but uh, this is what I want you to analyze. Here's the total income. Look at the numbers over the 12 months. They're pretty steady. They're pretty steady, even up until now. Now, remember, we're in March right now. So over the last three, well, over the last three months, hold on a second, what did he say? Um, let's go back to his numbers here. Okay. NOI. So he said that. Um, so seven hundred ninety-five thousand. Seven ninety-five divided by twelve is well, it's sixty-six thousand dollars a year. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, so if we take a look here, these numbers seem pretty darn steady. All the way through, these numbers are pretty pretty much right on the money. Uh, let's take a look at the expenses. 30, 40, 40, 44, 29, 46, 51, 49, 40, 40, 96. Ouch. What happened that month? And 53. These are expense numbers. Okay, so they did a lot in the office. 22, miscellaneous, op miscellaneous operating. Oh, depreciation. Why are they sticking that number in there? 
And look at that one. Oh, they pay the real estate taxes. Okay. See, depreciation shouldn't really even be in there. That's not a that's not an operating expense. Hmm. An interest expense shouldn't be in there either. That's kind of strange. What other income numbers they put in here? Contract, contract services, gas, water, like bookkeeping. All right. Okay, let me just do a quick little tally here. Bear with me here, folks. I just want to make sure that my numbers, after I've, after I've just moved the, um, deleted some columns, I want to make sure that my spreadsheet still works correctly. Uh, 08 minus 025. Good. Okay. All right. So we just got the NOI up to $451,000. Hey. Wow. Hmm. All right, let's use those numbers because, I mean, if they're, they're sticking the depreciation in there and they're sticking the um, the interest in there, that those aren't operating expenses. I, okay, so I tell you what, I'm not going to play any games here. Um, we're going to keep it real. And so if you were really doing this, if you own this property, you wouldn't include the depreciation in the expenses. You wouldn't include uh, the interest expenses in the unless the interest was for something that was operational, but I don't think it was. Uh, it might have been for a second mortgage or something like that. That is a below the line item. Here's the line. Remember, the NOI is the line. And so that's, you know, we, we don't want to cross that line. Um, we want to make sure that, uh, that only the proper you know, operating expenses and operating income are above the line. And that's going to give us the true number for the NOI. So I'm, I'm what I'm trying to tell you here is I think that my 451 is actually the true number. Um, so I don't I don't want to um, I'm going to use that number to help you come up with with your offer. But if the broker is going to tell me that it's 382, or if I look at it and it's 251, yeah, hey, I'm not here to teach these guys how to buy property. Let them figure it out on their own. On their own, if they come up with an NOI of 280 or something or something like that, a 382. Well, heck, we're going to use that one when we make our offer. But right now, I'm I'm going to teach you the right way, which is the 451. Well, what might happen is you might submit an offer based upon the original analysis with with those two line items included in, and the broker is going to say, "Hey, sorry, you know, you must have missed something because you're way off base." And then you're going to find, oh, "Okay, this is what I missed. I missed that the depreciation and the interest should not be in the uh, the in income and expense statement." So. All right, all right. I hope that does anybody have any questions on that? Let me know if that makes sense to you. Um, you know, we just got to make sure that we're, we're you know, um, I just want to make sure that you guys learn this the correct way and not the pie in the sky way. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do now that I have the the uh, profit and loss statement for 12 months, income expense statement, profit and loss. Uh, all the same, just goes by a different name. I'm going to come over here to Landlord Cash Flow Analyzer and start to input the data. All right, let's go with the input data section. Uh, this is a multifamily property. I don't know what the contract price is just yet. Okay, but let's try something new. Remember we, he showed us the sales comps over here? Let's go back to the sales comps. Here we go. What I'm looking for is what other properties like this in the eyes of the broker the properties that the broker says are comparable properties, see if I can get a cap rate on any of these properties. Uh, I might not be able to because we need the NOI to do that, and they may not have uh, included that in here. Okay, so nothing there. Nothing there. Yeah, as you can see, none of these sales comps are showing me a cap rate. And because he's not coming out with a cap rate on the... Um, all right, he's not showing a sales price or not asking price. I can't figure out what the cap rate is uh, in that particular market based upon this information. So, you know, let's then we get into the, the conversation. Well, what do my investors want to buy? Well, my investors want to buy a seven cap. So we're going to take seven and put it in there. Now we keep the six in there as the uh, future selling expense because, you know, three to five percent goes to the broker 
and you know one to two percent uh, you, you're going to set aside for closing expenses so your future selling expense is six percent you got to add that in there because that money is spent already you know it's going to cost you that to sell this property just had a conversation with an investor today she's going out to, to raise money for her deal and in the pr private placement memorandum they they weren't going to take any money back for the disposition fee and I said, you gotta, you gotta take, pay yourself at the close as well when you go to sell a property, because to sell the property takes an awful lot of work on the part of the investor. So, so pay yourself then as well. All right. Now down here under the mortgage, I'm going to leave 25% in there. I'm going to use four and a half percent of the interest. Now I'm using 25% because this is not a beautiful property. This property, and it's down there in a tough marketplace. So it's not going to be your, your Fannie Mae pre, uh, non pre review marketplace. I'm going to be conservative in my analysis of what the, what the type of, pro, of uh, debt I can buy on this property. So I'm going to use 25% down, 4.5% interest, and I'm going to go with a 25-year AM and not a 30-year AM. All right? So I'm being relatively conservative. If this were a B-class property, I could do much better on the terms. But because this is a C-class uh, property in, in, a, or in the Orlando marketplace, I'm going to be a little bit tighter on the terms. I could probably be even tighter than this, but I'm going to leave it like that for now. Now, the only other information I'm going to have to come back and add in here are the contract purchase price and closing costs. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to set anything aside for initial improvements, though if we made the offer on this property, I definitely would come back and add that information in there. Okay, so let's take a look at the rent roll. Um, now, what I'm going to do is just show you how this information goes in, uh, so that you can um, you'll understand it. I'm not going to uh, really give you a full breakdown um, because I just don't have time. I'm already halfway through. So uh, take a look at this. Um, I come back to this particular page, and uh, what I do is I, I do 40 ones. 56 two ones, four two one and a half. Uh, I've got 16 three twos and four studios. Okay, so what I'm going to do is come back here, and I'm going to input that information right here. I got uh, sing uh, one bedrooms. I got 40 of those. Uh, I've got uh, two. Uh, bed, room, one, bath, and that's, I got, let me see, 36 of those. We'll figure that out in just a second. Uh, two, bed, room, one, and bath, I'm going to, it's actually one and a half baths, but I'm going to let that slide. Um, then I got uh, three, bed, room, two, bath, and I've got 16 of those and then studios and I've got four of those 100 I'm off by yeah see this is a 56 perfect good okay now and now I go back to my spreadsheet and I say the market rents for these properties are 600 700 750 850 500 now know what I do here I'm going to take these market rents, not what they're getting, but what they could be getting. All right? I'm going to put it in right in here. And that is the gross potential right there, $981,600. Okay, that's what the property could collect. How much did it collect? Come right back over here. The rent, it collected 797, no, that's not the right number, tenant charge. Yeah, no, that's right, admin rent. It collected 797,671. What's the difference here? Seven, nine, okay, so what we need to do is this number right here, 932, has to equal 797,671. So how do I get the number from 981 down to 797? I'm going to play with this vacancy rate number right here. Let's put 20% in. Well, that's pretty darn close. Yeah, so we're looking at about 
19.5. Going the wrong way. Definitely going the wrong way. Yeah. Let's see. 797. Perfect. This property right now is running at an 18.75% vacancy loss. Now understand what that vacancy loss represents. It represents loss to lease, delinquencies, all forms of economic vacancy, physical vacancy, you name it. This property is almost over 18% away from its, its potential income. All right, so when they tell you, oh, the property is running at 97% occupied, then why are we off by 18.75% in what we can collect from the property? Well, and you ask that question to the broker, they'll be giving you the old humana, 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 humana. So does everybody see what I just did? I came up with the top line number, the property that this property has potential of making 981000 Then I figured out what the property actually made last year. And to get the system, this, the, the software, the cash flow analyzer, to generate that correct number, I've got to figure out what the actual vacancy rate is in that property. And it's 18.75%. So this property is running at 18.75%. It totally blows away the story of the broker that this property is 97% occupied. Yeah, that's great. You can put anybody in a unit, but it doesn't mean they're going to pay. All right? Any questions, just let me know. So. Right now, we've got the, uh, that's all I'm going to talk about on the, well, no, I can't, I'm sorry. Let's just do this quickly under the other income section uh, right here. Okay, so they've got other income of, oh, isn't that interesting? Oh, he's got the vacancies added in there. Yeah, he's seeing the vacancies at 32000 Yeah, not even close, pal. And then he's got the admin rent. So, hmm, I see what he's doing. Um... Yeah, that admin rent really should be above. It. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. The admin rent really should be a an item that goes towards reducing the income. Oh, which really should be in the vacancy. So I guess it is accounted for in, in the uh, vacancy number. Well, I'm okay. I'm not going to. Account. It should be accounted for in the vacancy number, and I think it is. Okay, so I'm going to go back here, and I'm just going to take these these um take the income numbers and uh, let's see formula sum I'm going to sum these numbers right here oh, what did I do I blew that one hold on let me undo that sometimes when you're sitting here doing this by yourself you forget that there are other people on the call uh, Okay, so I got to take this number here and do the formula for the summation. Take this right here and set that off. So 78,260. Uh, hold on one second. All right. So I got the back here, 78,260. And I'm not going to put the categories in. I'm just going to use, you know, stick the right monthly number in. So 78,260 is 65.21 of monthly income. And that's it. That's it. And let me just show you this here. Number of inputs, three or four, brings it right up. Uh, over here, as you can see, there are one, two, three, four, five types of units. So the number of units would be up to 10. So it's really, this is kind of a misnomer. It says number of units. It should be number of unit types. Uh, because remember, this is 120. So why don't I click down here of up to 150? Because then I got to scroll all the way down. And that's not what this block is meant to do. So I just clean it up and I keep it right there. Here I clean it up at four. And that should come back up. OK. So the income's done. Now the expenses. I'm not going to do the expenses like I did with the income, uh, but I, here's what I'm going to tell you. Uh, we've already cleaned out a lot of the junk of expenses that, that this particular spreadsheet had. 
this and look at the amortizations in there too. It's only eleven hundred bucks. Okay, that that stuff really shouldn't be in there. So anyway, what I'm going to do here is just check to make sure that all the rest of the categories are right. I'm going to capture this number down here three six eight zero eight four. I'm going to jump on over to the cat. Uh, jump on over to here three six eight. Three six eight zero eight four. I'm just going to stick under miscellaneous three six eight zero eight four and hit enter. Now, what is the most important thing for me to be looking at on this particular page? Anyone? Bueller? I'm waiting for your answer. What's the most important number that I'm looking for now on this particular page? No. Okay. The correct answer, okay, per, uh, percentage of revenue per unit, no. Oh, hold on. Maybe, maybe I'm oh, not reading the full answer from these people. Percentage per revenue, no. The per unit, no. Um, what the most important, well, percentage of revenue. So Mike is correct because he's looking at this column. But what I was actually looking for, which is still the correct answer, is the, um, is the um, expense ratio. This number right here, this percentage of re revenue column, is the expense ratio. So it's 42% on this particular property. 42%. How do we feel about that number? Who feels good about a C-class property in Florida, built in the 70s, running at a 42% expense ratio? Who can sell me on that number? Who's it going to be? Now that I lost my question block... Um, there we go. Who likes that analysis? You know, the thing about that is the fact that it is a an all bills paid. I'm not an all bills paid, but a tenant paid property. So right away, you can you can see the numbers coming down, and you're not looking at a typical C C class all bills paid property. Typical C class all bills paid, you're looking at sixty to seventy percent expense ratio. And I don't care who you are or what you're doing. If it's a C-class property that is an all-bills-paid property, 60 to 70% expense ratio. But this one they're showing it to be 42%. C-class tenant-paid utilities. Is 42 still an accurate number? I don't think it is. Because what I think is that if you're looking at a, a solid B-class property that is a tenant-paid property, you're looking at expense ratios in the 50% low to mid 50% expense ratio. So how can this crappy property come up with a lower expense ratio than a nicer property, uh, even though the same makeup, uh, you know, what the tenants pay is, is relatively the same? Now you might think to yourself, well, the, you know, the rents are higher on a B or what have you. It doesn't matter. I'm talking about a, on a percentage basis here. So 50% ratio, expense ratio is more in line with at the bare minimums, what this particular property should be uh, spending on their expenses. How can, if you went there and you looked at the books and said, no, nah, geez, Charlie, I looked at all the numbers and this guy really is running this property tightly at a 42% expense ratio. I looked at his checkbook. I know what he's spending on everything. Well, you know what he's spending, but what you don't know is what he is not spending. You get to a certain property like this where, where it is struggling uh, you know, to pay their bills, and we saw that this guy, well, you know, supposedly this guy is 97% all this, all this time. If, if the guy's able to run the property like this at that low, he's not paying his bills. Look at, look at what's missing here from the expenses. Okay, contract services, pretty darn low for contract services. Uh, where's his, um, Look at he's got no income for laundry and expenses, which means that he runs the laundry room himself. Well, where are the expenses for, for the laundry room? Uh, he's got, uh, you know, you can't tell me that a property down in Florida doesn't have a huge extermination contract. Where, where is it? All under the contract services here? Miscellaneous operating? I don't know. First off, he shouldn't have anything in miscellaneous. Any accountant worth their salt would say, you know, that's just... That's just crazy. You got you got to hide that number. You got to not hide it, but you just got to account for it. So you know, there's a lot of money there. Miscellaneous operating, forty-one thousand uh, dollars. I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to file taxes on my properties if I couldn't show the accountant what the miscellaneous expenses were for. 
So that's a problem. I don't like his books. I like the way this guy keeps his books. But anyway, we're going we're gonna, to uh, ramp up the expenses uh, to get it up to uh, $50,000 because that's going to give us more of, an, of a correct um, number. Jeez, I kind of go, let's go up to 70000 yeah, All right. Oh, look at that, 50% exactly. All right, so we're right at 50% expense ratio. All right, feels a little bit better. Now, here's the real test. Let's go back to the input data section. At a 7 cap, with the NOI that we just calculated, the property is worth, at the end of the first year, $6.2 million at a 7 cap. Look what happens if we do an 8 cap. It's worth 5.4. Let's go with an 8 cap. Let's tell them that our investors are only interested in 8 cap properties. So let's come up here to the contract purchase price and say $5.3 million is what we're looking to spend on this property. All right, so our offer is going to be $5.3 million. Is that a good deal? Is that a good deal for us? Well, you come up here and you click on the cash flow analyzer. Let the numbers work all the way through, and here's what we come up with. I come right down here to the financial measurements. 1.65 debt coverage ratio. Bob Marin, is that good? Let's see what Bob has to say. Oh, you know what? Mike made a very good point. <laughs> I love smart students. Okay, let's go back here for a second. Hmm. Yeah. Mike just wrote in here, said payroll question mark. And he's absolutely right. And not only payroll, but where's the, uh, the look at this. Um, where's the, uh, the management fee? Where's the property management fee? And not only the property management fee, but then the payroll on top of the property management fee. So if we're looking at, a, at uh, you know, say $1,000 per unit per year, let's say, you know, this is the payroll, um, $1,000, that's $120,000. Okay. And then if we said, let's uh, grab, um, let's insert a line here. And if we said payroll, uh, no, uh, property management, then this is going to equal, uh, let's see, we'll do the total income. Now let's do it on the rent um, times 0.045, we'll say. And then we'll just take this and we'll scroll this right over. And let's see what that does here. Okay, so now we're going to do a... Um, All right, so we took the, do we put the 120000 in there? Yep, that's in there right there. We got the property management fee right there. And now we're going to take a summation um, formula. Good stuff here. Good stuff, guys. Good catch. Good catch. 523, and then this is going to equal, okay, so we're 295 on the NOI. Let's come back over here. 295 on the NOI. Uh, net operating income, 295. Wow, we're way off. We are way off. 438. What, what do we say? 438, 523. Yep. Okay, 523, 428, 523, 523. So we're going to add $90,000 here. 528. Okay, you see what we just did? Let me kind of give you a little walkthrough. Mike uh, from Pennsylvania said, um, he said, hey, not only is there a problem with the, uh, with the expense ratio, but one of the reasons why the expense ratio is not what it should be is because we don't have any property management fee in there, and we also don't have any payroll. Now, for those of you that are new, you don't those two numbers are separate and distinct. If you see property management in there for three and a half, four percent, that does not include the payroll on the property. The payroll on the property is over and above the property management fee. So we needed to add in here the property management fee number, and then I also added in payroll. I used a rule of thumb number for payroll of $1,000 per unit per year. Now, they may balk at that and say, wait, that's way too high, but you know what? 
show me what your real numbers are, and then, you know, we got Obamacare, and, you know, they're, they're killing us, and so we're going to have to do $120,000 on the payroll. Property management, I just use 4.5% straight across the board, boom, comes up with a, with a total expenses of 523. I go back to the number here, I input, I just throw some more money under the expense column, and I get up to 528. And look at, when we add those other things in there, now our expense ratio is up to what we thought it was, the 60% expense ratio, which to me I feel a lot more comfortable with. So I think that now we have figured out what the right income and expense number is for these properties. Now let's go back to the input data because that changes everything. That changes everything. Look what happened. At an 8 cap, now the property is at 4.3. We were originally going to go out at 5.3. Just by adding in those two other line items from um, the teacher's assistant, uh, <laughs> he's actually a PA and not a TA. Um, you've got uh, now an uh, end of year valuation of 4.3. So now our offer is now 4.1. Now if it's at 4.1, how do the numbers look? Let's go back to the cash flow analyzer. I don't know, I see if Bob Marin woke up yet. Debt coverage ratio 1.7. Beautiful. Remember what I call the, the debt coverage ratio. That's your sleep number. The higher the number, the easier it is for you to sleep. 1.7 is an easy, easy number to sleep at. What's your cash and cash return? You're looking at 20%. Well, geez, Charlie, that's pretty high. That's, you know, pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered. You know what, folks? This is a C-class property. C-class properties take a lot of work to manage. So I'm telling you right now, I want that type of return. I want 13 percent, 15, 16, 17, 18. I want these types of numbers, or I'm not interested. So right now, I think we got it where we've got the right number, 4.3 million. Okay, so or actually 4.1 is what we said. So what do we do next? We make an offer. Now in this particular property, um, you notice it didn't say anything about uh, the financing. It didn't make us have to get our own, uh, you know, have to assume anything. It wasn't even in much of a discussion in it right here. Utilities, construction, mechanical. Yeah, there's no talk about financing or the fact that we have to do anything special for financing. So you know what? I'm going to I'm going to just go with um, go with my numbers. I'm just going to look for the address of this property because I'm going to need it in a second. Um, yeah, they don't even give me the address. Well, you can look it up. All right, so what I do is I come back here to the um, uh, to my spreadsheet, and remember how I had those three, um, those uh, four different um, letters of intent. I don't need the assumption. I don't really even need the long form. And this, you know, they're not going to sell it to me on the, on the first blush as a master lease option. So I'm just going to go with the old standby uh, letter of intent, uh, what I call the short form letter of intent. Now note here, you put the date on there, you, you know, you, you gussy up the date. Letter of intent, Tropicana Apartments. Uh, Tropicana. Apartments, you put the address in here, dear Mr. Broker, you put his real name in there. Um, and note, you know, please folks, don't do what, the, what they do, what, you know, all the mistakes I see made by those new investors who write up here at the top, letter of intent. You know, if you send out a letter like that, you might as well just add a line underneath it that says, just graduated from a boot camp, okay? You look like you just, you know, it's your first day on the job. Don't do this. That's, this is your company's letterhead. This letter is a business letter that goes out on your company's letterhead. Look professional. Don't go out there with some guy's template where he's got in italics, you know, letter of intent. That's, that's, you know, they see you coming a mile away. All right, now in this particular case, um, you understand most of the wording. I'm not going to go through uh, uh, too much of it. I'm just going to fill in some of the blanks here so you, you know how I come up with this. Uh, so I do $4.1 million. I'm going to do $41,000 for the earnest money deposit. And if you're in the owner's form, you could have that money available to you. All 
right, so uh, then what I'm going to do is um, figure out on a 4-1, remember how we said it was a 25%? So the first mortgage is going to be 3034, and then we just subtract from there. One oh two five, and there are the numbers. Now, why do I come up with these numbers? Why do I put this number in here? What I do, the reason why I do this is because it shows the buyer, the seller, that I'm putting 25% down. I'm anticipating that I'm going to need 25% down, and so therefore he's going to take me a little bit more seriously as, a, as more of a valid buyer. Um, if I went in here and just said, no, I'm going to do it all at 100% down, you know, 100% uh, no money down deal, he's going to look at that deal and say, forget it, I'm not interested in this guy. I want somebody that's going to come to the table with at least 25% down because the seller knows that this is an ugly property and he knows it's going to be hard to get a deal like this financed. So anybody that comes to the table with more cash is going to look better in his eyes. All right. Now remember what you also want to do is keep in mind the, uh, the inspection period. How much time are you going to need? The longer time you need, the less uh, your deal, less your offer looks, the lesser your offer looks to the buyer. The tighter the inspection period, uh, the better off, uh, you know, the, the stronger you're going to look as a buyer. In this particular case, you know, um, 30 days would be fine. Uh, you know, and down here you're going to put the 41,000. I will be deposited within three days. Can you write the check within three days? I know that our earnest money deposit program typically takes about five days uh, to happen, uh, so we'd want to add some time in there. And remember, that money gets written when the prop purchase and sale contract gets executed. Uh, okay, it can take 15 days to start that. Uh, brokerage fees paid by the seller. The closing date will be uh, before 60 days after the effective date. Um, let me see. Do I do it here? Um, okay, this particular earnest, this particular um, letter of intent is one of the older ones. You might want to go on the resources and archives and track down the more updated uh, letter of intent. The reason uh, why I say that is because what's missing in this is the floating effective date, which we tie into the time that we receive all of the um, all the due diligence material. Once we receive all the due diligence material, then the effective date begins. Okay, so that's that's number one. Uh, the other thing that's missing from this, obviously, is a financing period. We don't have any financing contingency in this letter of intent, and we definitely want to include that because this property is going to be a little tough to get financed. And also, what's missing is the Schedule One. If you look here, um, da, 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 da. oh, right here, D, all after receipt. Oh, actually. Um, Oh, look what we did here. Talk about a floating effective date. We said the, the earnest money deposit will be deposited with the escrow agent within three days after the receipt of all the documents listed in Schedule 1. The date of receipt of these documents shall be the effective date. So there's the floating effective date. Uh, but this particular document is missing the Schedule 1. You can find the Schedule 1 in the uh, Resources and Archives section of the membership site. Uh, go, go track it down there. Uh, but this is really all you're going to need to submit this offer. So it took us just about an hour. Um, you know, I, I would obviously go a little bit faster if I wasn't talking so much and if I had the right uh, letter of intent. And so what you do is you just put this on your letterhead, PDF it, and ship it on over to the broker. You're done. You do this twice a week and you will own a property within 90 days. Okay? you got to make offers. That's, that's the whole name of this game is making offers. Got to swing that bat. All right. Uh, let me just check for questions, and if there are none, great. Payroll. Yep, Mike got that payroll. All right. If nobody has any questions, just type it in the box here. If um, I hang up on you before you, you have an, a, a question, uh, send it on over to me uh, through info at multifamilyinvestingacademy.com. I will uh, get back to you as quickly as I possibly can. Um, but other than that, folks, there's a deal that we just analyzed. We came, we started off the, you know, beginning, uh, looking at it with no purchase price. Then we came up to 5.3, and then, uh, fortunately, Mike uh, picked up on that little error there, which we would have identified sooner or later. But Mike was on top of it, and uh, once you added those numbers in there, 
um, then it shows that the property is only worth 4.3 based on, but and even that folks you'd really need to get down there and do some hard due diligence you would really want to understand this the Sanford uh, marketplace and try to get a, f a flavor on what this property is all about the other thing you want to do with this property is type it into Google just type Tropicana Apartments Sanford and, and see what stories come up put in the address the specific address for that property into Google and see what stories come up now this is where you find the stories about the murders that take place on properties it's just by googling the address so make sure you do though that type of uh, information that type of searching before you go out and and, uh, and do this but I can tell you hey you, you, you spend an hour of your time working on the on this property you come up with an offer ship it out to the broker nothing ever got worse by making an offer on a property broker is going to now see you moving up the fo food chain and saying hey this guy's making offers okay this property stinks but let's go find him another one because you write offers offers are always good because now the broker says hey look it I'm getting activity aren't I a great broker or he's gonna say hey look it you want six million for this property I got an offer for 4.1 and this guy knows how to analyze deals so your six million dollar property is way out of line we gotta drop the price or I'm never gonna see a commission either way you help the broker so make the offer just make the offer. All right, folks, great talking with you. Uh, and um, we've got the uh, first rollout of the of the owner's forum is April 1st. Um, the ship has sailed. I'm going to send out another email to everybody if you still want to get involved. I'm working on some technical issues uh, with notifying everybody uh, on that right now. Uh, but that first uh, owner's forum class is all set. Um, and then also uh, I will um, be seeing you in about two weeks uh, based upon the um, based upon the uh, what is it the the next uh, group coaching call so thanks everyone I'll talk to y'all soon